My dearly beloved in Christ, today's gospel, taken from the 24th chapter of St. Matthew, tells us about two things. Our Lord is predicting two things that are to come. The first was the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place about 40 years later. And the second prediction pertains to the end of the world and the signs that would precede the end of the world and the second coming of our Lord. As he says, coming upon the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty. But there is a very interesting phrase at the beginning of the gospel selection that we read, where our Lord says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then the time is at hand for these things to take place. Now this phrase was first used by Daniel the prophet in the Old Testament, the abomination of desolation. And it's interesting that many of the fathers of the church and scripture scholars debate or discuss what exactly was the abomination of desolation. Some believe that the Romans, when they took over Jerusalem, they set up in the temple, the house of God in the temple, some uh, some of their standards and that that was sacrilegious. It, it desecrated the temple and that that's what it was referring to. Others, including St. Alphonsus Liguori, says that the abomination of desolation refers to a time when the mass will be destroyed. And we know the devil has always sought to undermine and destroy the mass. The mass is the most beautiful thing in the world. And the mass is the most important thing in the world because it is the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. In fact, going back to the Old Testament, we find a prophet named Malachi, Malachias, who predicted that the uh, there would be a sacrifice all over the world, that the time would come when there would be sacrifice offered everywhere. Now that was very uh, mysterious or confusing to the Jewish people when Malachias prophesied this because they were allowed to have sacrifices only in one place, and that was the temple. You remember the story of Pentecost that we read every year on Pentecost Sunday, how there were Jews who had gathered together from every nation under heaven at the time of the coming of the Holy Ghost. Well, why were these Jews from all these other countries present in Jerusalem? Because it was a special feast day, the Feast of Pass of uh, Pentecost. And devout and observant Jews would go to the temple if they could even once a year to celebrate these great feast days because sacrifices could not be offered in other places, only in the temple. And those sacrifices of the Old Testament were imperfect because they were offered in um, symbolism of or, or uh, as a type of the true and perfect sacrifice, which was that of our Lord on the cross. But at the Last Supper, our Lord changed the bread and wine into his body and blood. He offered the first Mass and he said to the apostles, do this in remembrance of me. And ever since then, in the church, we've had the apostles were the first bishops. They ordained successors who have ordained other bishops and priests. And down to the end of time, we have the Mass. And what is the Mass once again? It is the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Now the devil hates the Mass because he knows the value of the Mass. So the devil does everything he can to undermine the Mass. And we see this, for example, in the writings of Martin Luther who hated the Mass and sought to destroy the Mass. He said, call it a meal, call it a celebration, call it anything you want. Don't call it a sacrifice. He hated that idea of the Mass being a sacrifice. Well, what is interesting is that after Vatican II, there came the Novus Ordo Mise. And what was the Novus Ordo, or what is it, called? The celebration of the Lord's Supper. 
And the very idea of it being, of the Mass being a sacrifice, has been eliminated in the new Mass. And when the Novus Order was written, it was written primarily by uh, a bishop or Monsignor named Monsignor Bunini, who was later discovered to be a Freemason. And he was helped, he was assisted in this work by six Protestant ministers who were invited to come to the Vatican and help to rewrite the Catholic Mass. Why? Because of this whole push for ecumenism. They wanted the Mass, the new Mass, to be acceptable to non-Catholics so that therefore they could have this ecumenism, this unity. We look at the Novus Ordo Mise and we find that it is not simply a translation of the traditional Latin Mass into English, as some people mistakenly thought. But it was completely rewritten. And one of the striking things about the new Mass is that it is man-centered. The priest turns around, stands behind a table facing the people. For most churches, they eliminate the communion rail. And you have all kinds of lay people up in the sanctuary being lectors and Eucharistic ministers and so forth. Or people sometimes invited to come up and stand around the altar or, excuse me, the table. So it's a very man-centered. They have the handshake and so forth. It's no longer God-centered. Many of the genuflections have been eliminated. The whole idea of reverence. You'll find people in the modern churches before and after Mass talking in church. There's that loss of reverence. You also find the complete change of the language. And some people say, well, why was Mass offered in Latin anyway? Which it has been for more than 1,500 years before Vatican II. But Latin is ideal for the Mass for several reasons. First of all, the Latin language being a dead language, by which we mean it's not used in any country in the world as the language of the people, Consequently, it does not go undergo, or the words do not undergo, a change of meaning. If you compare the way we speak English with the way people in England or Australia or New Zealand speak English, they have different meanings to some of the words because English is a living language. So, Latin preserves the meaning of the doctrines that are expressed. Second, it is a beautiful mark of unity because wherever you go, you can go to France or Italy and not know the language of the people, but you would go to Mass and the Mass was the same everywhere. Furthermore, even though people didn't know Latin, by and large, they had their missiles and they could follow their missile and know what the priest is saying and follow the Mass in union with the priest. But also, the Mass being in Latin lends a certain reverence or dignity to the Mass from the very fact that the people don't understand Latin. In other words, it's something sacred. It's something that is special or unique. And so the mystery of the Latin language, the beautiful Latin language, adds to the reverence. Now, if you think back to the Old Testament, I mentioned Pentecost, with what, what is called the diaspora, the spread of Jewish people throughout the world. Those who had lived in other countries, grew up in other countries, when they came to Jerusalem, they didn't know the language of the Jewish people. They didn't know Hebrew. But they could go to the temple and be present at the sacrifice in the temple. And they were worshiping God. They were united in intention, in, in un uniting their will with the priest who was offering the sacrifice. They didn't need to know the language in which he was speaking. And so that really was a false reason given to the people. Well, we need to change it so that people can understand. People were able to attend Mass very well before the changes. And I would say to that argument, well, if changing the Mass from Latin into English is going to make it so much more understandable, then how come the Mass attendance has dropped, and dropped drastically? So... It shows that that was just an excuse they had to change the Mass. So this new Mass is not a true Mass. There's again the loss of reverence, it's man-centered, and they changed all of the prayers. 
For example, the offertory. The new Mass lacks a proper offertory. They use instead a prayer from the Jewish service of blessing before meals, thanking God for food, instead of offering the bread and wine in view of what it is to become. Also, they've changed you know, many other things, including the very words of consecration. But one thing that's particularly um, telling to me, particularly interesting, is that when they rewrote the Missal, the, the Novus Ordo, to write, there's the proper, I'm, I'm sorry, there's the, the ordinary, the Novus Ordo itself. But then what about all the propers? Now, they eliminated a lot of saints, that's true. But they took the orations that existed in the traditional Missal, and they carefully deleted any expressions referring to the necessity of renouncing the spirit of the world, mortification and self-denial, prayer for the souls in purgatory, miracles of the saints. All of these things were eliminated. Things that are not pleasing to modernists. The idea of penance and self-denial. Uh, the idea of working out one's salvation and that we have to work at it. It doesn't be come automatically. And again, prayers for the faithful departed. All of those references were eliminated from the prayers of the new Mass, indicating that they wanted to change the people's way of thinking. So when I read today's Gospel and come across that phrase, the abomination of desolation, it seems to me a very fitting description of the new Mass. St. Alphonsus Liguori actually predicted, now he wrote in the 1700s, he said that those words would refer to a time when the Mass would be destroyed throughout the world. And we know that the devil has always tried to destroy the Mass because it is the greatest thing, bringing down God's blessings of, upon the world. Again, the Mass is what we call a propitiatory sacrifice. That means it atones, it appeases God's wrath. You take away the Mass, and what is there to appease the just wrath of Almighty God? So let us treasure the Mass. Let us remember the value of the Mass. This reminds me of something, years. this is quite a few years ago, where somebody said to me, well, I broke my fast and I can't go to communion, so there's no point in going to Mass. And he was talking about Mass on a weekday, not on a Sunday. So there's no obligation to go. And he was saying, well, I'm not going to go because I can't receive communion because I broke my fast. That shows a very poor understanding, a lack of understanding of the greatness of the Mass, just to be present when our Lord is once again offering himself to his Father in the Holy Sacrifice. The Mass is a perfect sacrifice. It has all of the elements making it a sacrifice. And again, as Malachi has said in the Old Testament, predicting about a time from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, my name is great among the Gentiles, for in every place there is offered to me a sacrifice, a clean oblation. And when you think about the different time zones around the world, Mass is being offered somewhere all the time in the world by a true traditional Catholic priest. So let us treasure the Mass. Let us remember when we attend the Mass that we are present, as it were, on Calvary for the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of Christ to his Father to appease the just wrath of God and to bring God's blessings down upon this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.